Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House, taking a look at some of the guns they are going to be selling in their upcoming Spring of 2018 Firearms Auction. We have a really unusual one here today. This is a Model 33 Hyde submachine gun. George Hyde is one of those gun designers who was pretty involved in a lot of different projects, but you don't really hear his name around very much. He, unlike many other designers, he didn't really end up with an iconic, an iconic gun with his name attached to it. Now this is pretty much the first firearm that he really fully developed, uh, and it's pretty early in his career, 1933. Uh, he was a German-born gunsmith and emigrated to the United States in 1927, opened up his own uh, company under his own name, worked there for a while. He then ended up working as the shop foreman for Griffin & Howe, uh, who did custom rifles, and you may know them from their work uh, making sniper versions of the M1 Garand. And then after that, he went on to work for GM, where he was actually the, the uh, chief engineer for GM's Inland division. And you may recognize Inland from a number of guns that they manufactured during World War II. Now, Hyde began with this. Uh, the Model 33 didn't really go anywhere. Well, didn't do anything by itself. It was the basis for a slightly improved version, the Model 1935, or 35. Uh, which was actually tested by the U.S. military in 1939. As a, well, as soon as the U.S. Army started, U.S. military started buying Thompson guns, they immediately started looking for a better option than the Thompson gun, and tested a number of, of other alternatives, including Hyde's Model 35. Now, in those trials, this gun actually showed a substantial amount of promise. It was better than the Thompson in the mud and the dust tests. It was cheaper to manufacture. It was simpler internally. But it had a couple of problems, um, one of them being the charging handle, which we'll look at in just a moment. Uh, it had some weak parts in the bolt, which again we'll look at in a moment. Magazine springs were apparently weak. These all seem like issues that could have been addressed, but Hyde opted not to pursue this any farther, because by 1939 he had already moved on to other, to other projects. And in fact, he got a later version, a, a later submachine gun design adopted by the U.S. military. The M2 submachine gun was adopted in 1942 to replace the Thompson, uh, designed by Hyde. Unfortunately, it took over a year to try and get the thing into production, and ultimately they had serious production problems, and the whole contract uh, for the M2 was cancelled, with only a few hundred having been made. Instead, the military ended up adopting the M3, the grease gun. Now, the M3 was also co-designed by George Hyde. So ultimately, what he started in 1933 did basically work out, and uh, he was the designer of one of the main submachine guns adopted by the U.S. military. Uh, as, his, as chief designer for Inland, he was also heavily involved in Inland's production of the M1 carbine. Uh, he was also the designer of the Liberator pistol, little single-shot 45 caliber guns that were intended uh, to be mass-dropped to European resistance movements. So, like I said at the beginning, a, a name you don't hear very often, but a guy who was very deeply involved with a lot of munitions projects during World War II. So, uh, this being his very first submachine gun design, why don't we take a closer look at it? Obviously, as you can see just from a brief glance, Hyde took a lot of cues from the Thompson submachine gun uh, in the basic layout of his submachine gun. Uh, some of the really obvious ones are the vertical front grip, the style of the buttstock. Um, this has a pretty long length of pole, and it actually sits relatively high up off the shoulder. Um, there's a lot of drop in the stock. Again, these are features that the Thompson also has. If we look closer, though, we can see that that influence extended beyond just the overall layout. So the controls on the Hyde 33, for example, are very similar to the Thompson's. Up in front, we have a semi and full auto selector switch. RF is full auto, SF is semi auto. And then uh, behind that, we have a second selector, and this is fire and safe. So that's the same sort of uh, control arrangement that the Thompson had. Put the gun on safe, well, you put the gun on fire, and it will fire, and then the mode of firing is controlled by the front switch, semi or full. The magazine well here is cut rather like the Thompson guns, uh, the, the Thompsons that have cuts for drums in them. Uh, however, on this, the magazine, well, the magazine system is a little bit wonkier than the Thompson. You have a magazine release button right here, and then the magazine actually slides out the side straight out, well, towards the camera in this shot. However, and I think this is one of the shortcomings of the design, which wouldn't have been all that difficult to fix, 
you cannot remove or insert the magazine if the bolt is closed, because the bolt uh, is traveling over the top, well, in between the magazine feed lips. So we have to charge the gun before we can remove the mag. The charging handle is back here. When I pull that back, you can see the bolt retracts. Now with the bolt lock back, I can remove the magazine out the side. It's got a couple of really big guide rails on it, and then it also has this catch to help hold the magazine stable in position. And that connects with this uh, block on the magazine catch. So you see the rails there. It's possible that Hyde wanted to be able to design a drum magazine like the Thompson. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there was never one uh, actually manufactured, but there could have been. One of the other interesting uh, side effects of this design is that uh, while the standard magazine here is only 20 rounds, Hyde actually made 40 and 60 round magazines by taking multiple 20 rounders and brazing them together side by side. That's not something you can do on a magazine that inserts vertically, uh, but it is something you can do on a magazine that inserts horizontally. And for a system like that, this catch here, and there would have been three of them, would have been what you use to index which magazine is actually lined up in the gun. So that's kind of cool. Unfortunately, I don't have a multiple magazine here to show you. But, um, I would also point out that, like the Thompson, this is a double feed magazine. So that's generally considered the better uh, of the magazine styles. Mechanically, this is just a simple blowback action. So there's a big recoil spring inside here, along with the guide rod for this charging handle and the mass of the bolt. That's all that holds it closed, which is fine. That's how virtually all submachine guns work. However, there were a couple other problems that Aberdeen found with the Model 35, which shares the same basic design with the 33 here. One of them was apparently that this handle tended to come back into the shooter's uh, face every time the gun was fired. Now, I don't think it changed on the 35, and on the 33 this is not a... Uh, uh, this is not fixed to the bolt. So when the bolt comes all the way back, this handle can still be all the way forward, as you can see when I cock it. So there it is cocked, and then the handle returns under some spring pressure. But apparently when firing this would tend to bounce back. They specifically said it wasn't actually dangerous, but it was pretty disconcerting to the shooters to have that coming back at them. Now there was also an issue of durability. So I have to kind of use a flashlight to get inside here to show you. But if you look there, the bolt face is recessed, and so you've got three flanges around the outside of the bolt. Uh, that, th and that's a good thing. That acts to fully support the case head when it fires. However, apparently those were not heat treated quite right or not manufactured quite right, and those flanges had a tendency to break off uh, when, if the gun was dry fired. So uh, that was one of the problems that uh, Aberdeen found with the gun. And just a few final elements to it. Um, again, copying the Thompson, this, the buttstock on the hide is removable. So you push in that button, and there is a bayonet style lug on the bottom that allows the buttstock to come off. The barrel is, of course, fluted like a Thompson. The Model 33 had a bare muzzle, but the uh, Model 35 added a compensator. We have a barleycorn style of uh, sight setup with a tangent here. Uh, really finely adjustable uh, to like tens of yards. And, and kind of interesting that instead of the typical 25, 50, 75, they went with 30, 50, and then 80 yards. Uh, but then 125, 150, and then back to 180. So interesting set of ranges there. I don't know that you really need to make side adjustments between, say, 30 and 50 yards. But with 45 ACP, perhaps you did. And the markings on top of the receiver indicate that this is a Model 33. Serial number is 174, which seems a bit high. Patent applied for, and manufactured by the Hyde Arms Company of New York. And note that the front grip is held on pretty much the exact same way as the Thompson's is, uh, with this tongue coming out the front of the receiver to which the grip is screwed. So what Hyde had managed to do here was create a gun that had basically the same handling characteristics as the Thompson, uh, while being less expensive to manufacture, simpler internally, and a little bit lighter. This came in at 9.5 pounds, or about 14 and a quarter kilos. Uh, fired at about 725 rounds per minute, uh, which is uh, about what the military was looking for. Exact production numbers on the Hyde submachine guns are not really available. 
Uh, my understanding is that there were between 60 and 100 of the Model 35s made. I would expect there to have been fewer of the Model 33s. That serial number 174 suggests more than that, but we don't know where that serial number range started, so I don't really have data on that to share with you. However, needless to say, they are quite scarce today. Uh, this one is fully transferable, registered uh, with the NFA, and a Curio and Relic machine gun. So if you're interested in having it yourself, well, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Julia's catalog page on this guy, where you can find their pictures, their uh, description, their value estimates, and everything else you would need to know to place a bid on it, and hopefully add it to your own collection. Thanks for watching.